Hello, this is David Wilson for This View of Life, and uh, this is our second TVOL 1000 uh, webinar, monthly webinars, and I'm very uh, pleased to uh, have uh, Peter Turchin, uh, Vice President of the Evolution Institute and Professor at the uh, University of Connecticut at Storrs, and Dan Hoyer, a Project Manager uh, for the SayShot project that we'll be learning about, um, and uh, who's also at the University of uh, of uh, Toronto. So our topic today is ultra, social, uh, ultra society and more generally this view of history. And uh, before we get going, um, I want to just say that uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions in two ways. One is on the chat box and the other is by raising your hand. There's a little hand icon. And in that case, you could actually speak to Peter during the Q&A. You can chat your comments at any time and uh, you can raise your hand at any time, but uh, it won't be activated until after Peter's seminar, which will be about 20 minutes or so, uh, leaving lots of time for Q&A. So without any further ado, uh, Peter, uh, take it away. Thank you, David. So the topic of my uh, webinar today is the question, how cultural evolution helps us understand the rise of complex societies in human history. And there are two pattern deities that we'll be watching over this talk. One of them is Cleo, the Greek muse of history, and the other one is lesser known, Seshat, who is an Egyptian deity of scribing information and by implication databases. The human species is remarkably good at one thing. We can cooperate in really large groups. And this International Space Station image is a great symbol to illustrate our capacity for such uh, large-scale cooperation. Think about it. International Space Station has been constructed by an international consortium that includes old uh, Cold War enemies, Russia and the United States, also European Space Agency, Japanese, Canadians, and a few other countries who have contributed to the ISS. It is probably the most expensive construction in human history. Its cost has been estimated at 150 billion. An estimated 3 million people years were necessary to put the station into the orbit and uh, construct it all together. But um, even more broadly, people like myself, I'm an American taxpayer, I have also contributed to the ISS by simply paying taxes. So um, if you take a more broad look, more than a billion citizens of those countries have contributed. This is a remarkable scale of cooperation. What is other remarkable feature about the human capacity for cooperation is it's very, very recent. In evolutionary terms, it's extremely recent. So Let's try this. Let's use uh, large construction projects like ISS and go back in time and basically use that as a proxy for the capacity of humans to cooperate. And let's see how far back in human history we can see evidence of such large scale cooperation. If you go back about a century, you'll see the Empire State Building, one of the largest and most impressive buildings at the time. 800 years ago, we would see cathedrals such as the Amiens Cathedral pictured here. The Amiens Cathedral actually is as large, it weighs as much as the Empire State Building, although, of course, it's not quite as tall. Well, let's go back four and a half thousand years ago, and we see the great pyramids of Egypt. We keep going back, and finally, we get into the ninth millennium BC, and we see this remarkable structure in southeastern Turkey, uh, on a hill which is known as Gobekli Tepe. This is the first known large-scale construction, which was probably a temple that, that humans have constructed. So 11,000 years ago, and that's it. As we go back in the past beyond 11,000 years, we don't see any evidence of large-scale cooperation in humans. What we see is evidence of campsites and the such but no monumental construction. All right, now let's reverse our um, 
progress and go back from the people history into time. So the human species roughly arose about 200,000 years ago, right? So this table shows the social scale at which human societies operated during the evolutionary history of our species. The foraging bands that occupied Africa and some other parts of the world 200,000 years ago were numbered in tens. 10,000 years ago, we see first farming villages, which were maybe uh, have, uh, which probably had populations of 100. First uh, centralized societies arose seven and a half thousand years ago. We call them simple chiefdoms in Mesopotamia. Complex chiefdoms arose a, a little later. We see archaic states about 5,000 years ago, large states that had millions of people of population uh, four and a half thousand years ago, and the first mega empires of tens of millions of people two and a half millennia ago. So what you see here is a very rapid increase in the scale at which humans cooperate. And in the process, we have become the champion cooperators in the world. Until roughly speaking, two or 3,000 years ago, the champion cooperators on Earth were social insects, such as leafcutter ants, for example. Leaf cutter ant colonies number in millions of individuals, and they have elaborate, they construct underground cities, they grow, uh, they, uh, they perform agriculture, they have high division of labor. It's a remarkable species, no question about it. However, by the time we got to the mega empires phase, so two and a half thousand years ago, we have exceeded the scale of cooperation that uh, has been observed before for hundred. Uh, for about 100 million years, which is when the first uh, ants uh, evolved. So not only we are um, champion cooperators, but it has happened exceedingly rapidly, really within the last 10,000 years. So this observation leads me to the central question of this um, webinar. We call it the puzzle of outer sociality. So what is outer sociality? Outer sociality is defined as an extensive cooperation among very large numbers of genetically unrelated individuals. So in this respect, humans are a unique species because other species also co cooperate in very large numbers like ants and bees and termites. But those typically tend to be genetic relatives. Other mammals can cooperate, but in much, much smaller groups, tens of individuals at most. So outer sociality is actually a uh, unique characteristic of one particular species and a very successful species, as is evidenced uh, by a variety of indicators. So um, outer sociality cooperation is the key glue that holds together not only our own on modern societies, but also historical mega empires, such as the Achaemenid Empire in Iran, Persia, which is pictured on this uh, slide. The, the big question about outer sociality is how did it evolve? After all, cooperation, as is well known, is very fragile and it is easily destroyed by uh, free writing. So how did it evolve despite the tendency of uh, humans, of agents, to free ride? It's one of the unresolved grand questions in social science. And that's what, that's what uh, the, and the answer to this question is what I aim to understand. So there could be three themes I want to touch upon in the rest of my talk. First of all, methodological theme. How do we actually answer questions like I have just posed? And then I will go and illustrate the approach with a specific mathematical model and uh, also the data, uh, how you, uh, the question how we can test mathematical theories with historical uh, data. So without further ado, let's talk about first about how do we actually answer questions like I have just posed. After all, evolution of large scale complex societies has been uh, thought about by many thinkers going back thousands of years. And there are many theories that people have produced. Some people 
argue that it's really agriculture, which is the key thing. Others talk about social differentiation and class structure. Yet the third group thinks warfare is the key evolutionary driver. And there are many other theories focusing on economics and trade, problem solving and information processing and so on and so forth. I belong to uh, the new uh, discipline of cultural evolution in which there is uh, one central theory called cultural multi-level selection. That's the theory that I'll, I will be explaining in my uh, talk. So what um, cultural evolution actually helps us understand is that the question of how outer social traits spread is not a simple matter of accounting for their benefits for integrating large-scale societies. That's where many so-called functional theories go wrong is because they say, well, cooperation is extremely powerful. It produces all kinds of public goods. But that's not enough. We need to understand also how uh, cooperation, which is very costly to individuals. So institutions of cooperation have significant costs. And uh, the historical record, by the way, indicates that when societies scale down, uh, cooperative institutions, outer social institutions, actually tend to disappear. They, tends to, they tend to be washed out by evolution. So this, the costs are quite significant. So what we need, we need an evolutionary mechanism that will help us explain how such traits, how such cultural traits uh, spread despite their costs. So let me illustrate this cooperative dilemma with a historical uh, set of institutions. The question that I would ask is, should the rulers and elites be self-serving or should they act in prosocial ways that benefit governed populations? What can cultural evolution tell us about this uh, dilemma? We know that rulers um, across the history had came from both of these forms. So one example of a quite despotic individual is Tiglat Pileser, who was an Assyrian king in the seventh century BC. So here is an from an inscription that he left for us. I am Tiglat Pileser, the powerful king, supreme king, king of the four regions, king of the whole kings, lord of lords, the supreme, monarch of monarchs, and so on and so on. It just goes on. All right. And he didn't just uh, was a very self-centered and very self uh, congratulatory individual. He actually did, uh, he oppressed uh, people in a big way. He, uh, there is another inscription where he talk, talks about how he stripped the skins of people and, uh, you know, flayed them, impaled them and things like that. So this is a typical despotic uh, king that we are actually quite encounter quite frequently in human history. But there were other kings. So Ashoka Maria, Ashoka the Great, who lived in the third century BC and governed a huge empire in India, was a very different individual. He also left an inscription. And where he wrote things like, my magistrates are working amongst the people. They are left, they are, uh, they are trying to do their duties confidently and fearlessly so that they can work for the welfare, happiness, and benefit of the people in the country very different approach. And he talks about how he makes provisions to uh, create uh, institutions that would do medical treatment, with not just humans, but also animals. It's actually quite, quite touching, his concern for animals. He talks about all the different ways that he actually tries, tries to make uh, life of people in his state better, more uh, uh, greater welfare, happiness, and benefit. So um, here is the cultural multi-level selection view on despotism versus prosociality. Despotism serves the rulers and the elites quite well. Thank you. In, fa in fact, because they tend to gather large harems, it tends to increase their genetic fitness. So from their point of view, it's fine. However, what it does also, it undermines cooperation between the rulers and the population and makes such as despotic societies quite fragile. So what we need, we need to understand how selection works at multiple level. At one level, the inequity norms will tend to increase because the rulers have a lot of power within societies and they will tend to favor that. So inequality and despotism will grow. But there are other societies and competition between societies would work to weed out despotic societies and that would result in the spread of prosocial and equity-promoting norms. 
So these two different processes working against each other, the balance of them is where the, all the action is. So, so I have proposed one particular explanation, but how can we test such um, theories? And that's where Clio dynamics from Clio, the muse of history, um, comes in. Clio dynamics is basically treating history as just another science. And you do the old, old fashioned, well tested scientific approach. You define the question which I have done already, the puzzle of outer society. You propose alternative explanations, theories that has been done already by many thinkers before us. The next key step is to translate those alternative theories into mathematical models because we need predictions. We need very precise predictions from these theories to be tested with data. And then we put together data to, uh, to test theories. And then we repeat this as many times as necessary. So let's uh, talk, let me give you an example of how one might actually go about it. And I'll talk about one particular mathematical model that was uh, put together with me and colleagues. The model actually tries to understand how outer social norms and institutions could evolve. The historical period that we have addressed is the 3000 years from 1500 BCE to 1500 CE. In other words, we are talking about the ancient and medieval period of human history. The spatial domain is what's known technically as Afro-Eurasia or simply the old world. We divide space into cells and then basically an agent-based model allows these cells to evolve, try to conquer each other and increase, uh, add, uh, add other cells, increase the polity size and things like that. I will not go into details because this uh, paper has been published in PNAS a couple of years ago. Here are, by the way, my colleagues, Sergei Gavrilets, Tom Curry, and um, Edward uh, Turner. So I will not give all the details. I'll just uh, give you just a couple high highlights. And if you're interested, you can basically go ahead and look at the details. So the general logic of the model, as I said, is to understand how cultural traits that enable larger scale organization, ultra social traits, how can they spread despite costs. The major engine of evolution is cultural multi-level selection. So as I said, ultra-social traits decline within groups, and that's what the model captures. But uh, ultra-social traits also increase the competitive ability of the group in which they are against other groups. They convey the benefits for greater social and political stability, and they make those societies more effective at warfare, both defense and offense. So groups in the model compete via warfare and winning groups annex losing losers and impose their culture on the defeated. So this is basically how cultural multi-level selection works in the model. The model actually uses the landscape of Afro-Eurasia and it uses certain historical facts we know about. There's been a certain a uh, set of military technologies that spread from the Great Step, basically horse-based technologies. In addition, some uh, iron and bronze or so metal-based uh, technologies. So we actually take that into account. And as these technologies spread uh, through Afro-Eurasia, they trigger more intense warfare. And more intense warfare means more intense between societies competition. And that's what drives the evolution of, of outer social traits. And outer social traits underlie the rise of large scale societies because large scale societies will fall apart without such outer social uh, traits. So that's basically all I will say about the mechanics of the model. And let me just show you what the model does. What the model does is, in, is uh, depicted on this slide. So look first at the upper left corner. Here we have the situation in 1400 BCE, 100 years after the start of the simulation. The uh, yellowish uh, squares indicate where the first outer social traits started to appear in this, uh, in this landscape. Note that we, had, we don't seed any particular areas with outer social traits. All cells in the simulation, any 
you know, where, wherever they are in this uh, in this world, they all can mutate. They can, they can all acquire an outer social trait by mutation. So the key dynamic is then what happens to the competition between societies. Within each cell, the outer social traits tend to be lost much faster than they can mutate in the other direction. But because societies compete, they can conquer each other and, and spread culture. That's what you see here. You, see, you suddenly see several hot spots show up. Interestingly enough, these hot spots tend to be the, so the three usual suspects, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and North China. And eventually, as you can see in the lower panel, by 1000 CE, the outer social traits have spread quite rapidly. So the co cover here, red, indicates uh, quite a large number, maybe eight, nine outer social traits present in that particular cell. And green indicates no outer social traits present. So we see over the period of 3,000 years how in the, mo the model predicts that outer social uh, traits would spread. We can also uh, extract from the model prediction of uh, the spread of large states. And we, uh, we quantify that by constructing um, the variable called macrostate density. I will explain what this macrostate density is in a minute when I show you how we did it in data. So what we're going to do, this is the prediction that I'm actually going to test right in front of your amazed eyes in the next uh, two or three minutes. All right. So how do we test this prediction? That's the last part of my talk. Well, again, we go to um, the same uh, spatial domain in the same time period, and we uh, construct uh, imperial density maps. So this imperial density maps will be constructed in data the same way that we extract these variables from the model. And I would do three time slices for each of the millennia. So here's how it works in uh, history. You go to 1500 BC, and we basically put down all the states that exceeded 100,000 kilometers in the extent of territory that they controlled. And so the red uh, blots are those uh, states that you see in 1500 BC. Then we traveled forward one century and do the same thing. And we just keep going and do that. Boom. All right, so at the end of the first uh, millennium, after 10 time steps, we, base, we calculate um, how each square in this landscape, how uh, often it was within a macro state. So the reddish color indicates very frequent occurrence of macro states in that area, and greenish color indicates no occurrence. And then you go to the next millennium and do the same thing. And then we also uh, summarize the previous uh, 10 slides in another heat map. And then we do the same for the last millennium. I'll, I'll skip the uh, map test. So now we have three microstate density maps, each for 1,000 year period. We can now compare it, this data, to models. So on the left hand side, we have uh, the data derived pictures, and on the right hand side, you have the model derived pictures. And you can see that model, of course, doesn't do a perfect uh, job, but it does an awfully good job explaining the, uh, the rise and spread of uh, large scale societies. And remember that we did not seed the model with putting large scale societies here and there. The, all those hot spots arose as a result of uh, interactions within the model. Peter, I got to break in. Can you hear me? Yes. Very quickly. Uh, why don't the centers of those empires turn green? Because you're saying that uh, that uh, non-cooperation is beating cooperation within within any square. So why aren't they, why aren't the centers of these empires uh, collapsing? Uh, so they are collapsing. If you can see here, uh, you, if you see actually they're uh, arising and collapsing. But okay. um, uh, when you actually get to this view, you look at what happened over the last thousand years. So in Egypt, we had a number of empires that arose and collapsed. But uh, uh, they, they very soon reconstitute themselves after they have collapsed. All right. So this view actually averages over 
the whole millennium of uh, state building. Okay, so there's been cycles during that period. Yes, there are cycles, but we are not interested in uh, uh, f uh, following cycles here. We are just looking at a very macro historical uh, way of, uh, of of viewing the well, uh, Afro-Eurasian history. Great, thank you very much. All right, so basic, so at this point, let me just say that I um, have a few slides to, um, to bring this talk uh, to a conclusion. And let me first mention that uh, what I've done here is um, a very simple minded comparison, minded comparison between uh, data and uh, models. We are looking just at where the large scale states are in human history. But we are also interested in testing the prediction of the model about the spread of outer social traits. And for that, we need to do something more elaborate. And that's why I've been involved in the Seshat project. So over the last six years or so, we've been trying to plunge and collect data from the huge corpus of knowledge about past societies that is collectively possessed by academic historians and archaeologists. It is not in the form that is easily accessible to testing theories and the job of our project is to trans transform that knowledge into a machine readable form that we can then test uh, theories. This uh, constructing this data bank is the most important thing uh, that we need at this point because we have lots of theories and lots of mathematical models, but we don't have the data to actually test all those multitude of models. So just very briefly, what we do, we actually sample the whole world. There are 30 locations here uh, re uh, certified by the uh, how um, late or early social complexity arose. And at this point, uh, we have quite a lot of data. We have 34 actually areas on the world already because we started to expand from the original 30. We have about 400 polities, 1,500 variables and almost 200,000 data points. All right, so to bring it up, um, so what, what, what I have argued in this talk um, is that the main evolutionary force driving the evolution of outer sociality is cultural multi-level selection. It is competition between societies that is the evolutionary engine that actually allowed humans to cooperate, to cooperate in such large scale groups. Unfortunately, the bad part of the news is that for most of human evolutionary history, the way societies have competed has been war. Recently, however, gentler forms of societal selection have come to the fore. I'll talk about that in just a minute. So the evolutionary logic here is societies need to scale up because larger societies win over small, uh, smaller ones. But that's not the only thing that goes on. More equitable, more equitable societies also win over despotic societies. So you see both the uh, evolution of uh, large scale cooperation and the evolution of equity promoting uh, cooperative norms. The important part here is that um, it sort of is a foregone conclusion in, some many, way, in many ways. It's actually hard for me to understand why people like John, like Richard Dawkins, for example, argue against uh, cultural multi-level selection. After all, our societies have elaborate governance institutions that make cooperation quite uh, possible. All right. So uh, it's just like our societies are like like multicellular organisms. Large large organisms have to have integrative um, features, uh, neural uh, nets. Um, hormonal system and things like that, and so do societies. So how could possibly societies acquire such society-wide traits if there is no selection at the level of societies? It's really the competition between societies, which is key part of multi-level selection that is the driver here. All right, and the nature of competition has changed. So for most of our evolutionary history of our genus, at least, in Pleistocene, I think that the struggle for existence against harsh, rapidly changing environment was the major uh, evolutionary driver. So uh, different groups competed, but indirectly, they competed against the harsh environment, right? And those groups that failed were washed out. And it is a form of multi-level selection. 
right? Now, in the Holocene, the last 12,000 years, until quite recently, it was a struggle against other groups. So I talked about ancient and medieval history, and I mentioned that one of the drivers was horse-based warfare, which is the technology that made competition between societies more extreme, all right? The other ones were projectiles and metallurgy. More recently, after 500s, we have actually different types of military technologies coming to the fore. So guns and sailing ships, and Europeans become white inner Asians. And today, uh, it is um, st the struggle to produce high quality for life for citizens. So warfare is still present, but uh, uh, gentler, gentler forms of between society competition actually come to the fore. So one example is a transition to a market economy in USSR. And other examples are Arab Springs, which were driven in a large degree by the desire of populations in those countries to increase the quality of their life. So a war is of lesser importance uh, uh, than it has ever been. And uh, the imitation of successful traits, of traits of successful societies, becomes more important than conquest and imposition of culture. Well, thank you very much for listening to me, and also thank you to our, a variety of our sponsors who have made the CSHAT project possible. Awesome. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, okay, so uh, Dan, would you like to say a little bit about uh, a little bit more about CSHAT from your perspective? Yes, uh, I think so. So uh, again, thank you, Peter. That was a really engaging talk. I think you did a great job sort of giving a, a good overview of, of what you've been working on and sort of what we've been working on together, uh, trying to turn history into data. Um, so just to give everyone sort of an introduction of, of who I am, I'm uh, Dan Hoyer, I'm a project manager of the Seshat Data Bank, um, which we'll be talking about more in a second. I've been working with Peter and Seshat for about three years now. Um, I'm originally an ancient historian, uh, but became interested in more sort of theoretical methods, uh, social science methods and uh, adapting some sort of evolutionary uh, mechanisms and, and sort of long-term dynamics to understand exactly the, the human past. And that's how I got into um, Clio Dynamics and became involved in the Seshat project. So I know that uh, everyone will have a lot of questions uh, being raised by Peter's talk. There was a lot of, of stuff there, uh, interesting things to, to get our heads around. I want to ask kind of two very broad scale questions, first of all, that I think will touch on a lot of the things um, people want to know about. First, Peter, you, you mentioned sort of two of your key topics were um, sort of Clio dynamics in general, how we are turning history into a real sort of predictive science or a theoretical science, as well as sort of the data that we're using. And you gave a great example of the spread of macro states and how this works. And I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit more about Seshat, what exactly it is that we're doing how we are we're taking you know really rich historical information and turning it into data that can be analyzed in these sorts of ways and, and you mentioned you know a lot of theories and models that we have to test maybe you can talk about some of the the things we're doing and how we're using history uh, as a means to actually test these things yes uh, thanks dan so let me turn back to my uh, slides and just use um, um, this slide to illustrate the idea Basically, we want to test uh, theories about how societies have evolved. That means that we need to have the temporal component. In the Sashat project, we have uh, sampled the world uh, in, using a stratified sample so that each of the continents, like North America, Europe, gets three points. And these are further stratified by when complexity evolved, early, intermediate, or late. So the purpose of this sample is to create as much variance as possible for the statistical analysis and also for testing theories. Eventually, by the way, we will, we will want to do, to do the whole world, but you have to start somewhere. And then at each of these sampling points, like this is Kahokia, for example, we drill back in time to the start of Neolithic, so to the first appearance of agriculture, in some areas, like the Southwest, we go back 10,000 years. In other places, we go less. And then we sample all societies that occupy that particular spot on Earth. And these are the societies. Actually, we call them polities. A polity includes empires, states, chiefdoms, and independent villages uh, as a smaller kind of a polity. 
So we then uh, record the characteristics, the non-characteristic of those uh, qualities. And returning to the subject of my talk, we want to, re to uh, re record such characteristics as, for example, the degree of prosociality observed amongst the elites and the rulers. What are the constraints on, lure, on, on ruler behavior to make them behave more prosocially rather than selfishly? So things like that. But in reality, we have 1,500 variables already. So we're covering uh, an awful lot of aspects of these uh, societies. And so we have, I, I should mention that the first paper based on social complexity variables has already been submitted recently to a journal. So we are in the process of analyzing the data. And so by the, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, we will start populating the cemetery of defunct theories because our goal is destructive. We want to kill all bad theories. So only the good ones are remaining. Mm -hmm. So uh, Peter, I'd like to uh, just jump in on that question and to ask why is this a new approach to uh, history or is it? And uh, what is the response of, uh, of more traditional historians? And has that changed uh, over the period of the project? Because I know years ago, I invited you to give a talk here at Binghamton when it was all this was starting. And there was a, we had an eminent Egyptologist on our faculty who left a very unhappy man. So I was just thinking, you know, what, uh, relate this, why is this a new approach to, to, to the study of human history? So it's new in, in, in the uh, complex of its features. There have been other databases like standard cross-cultural sample that people have used very effectively to test theories. Unfortunately, that particular database is static. It doesn't give you historical depth. It only tells you what happened to societies at one particular time. And to test evolutionary theories, which are about change, we need uh, that uh, historical component. Also, the scale, the sheer scale of our approach, um, almost 200,000, and we will have million, a million data points in a few years. So trying to cover as much of human, uh, non-human history as possible, that's uh, completely new. And the other thing is our explicit focus on testing theories. It's theory-driven approach. Because as I said, we want to kill off bad theories. We, don't, we want to stop this multiplication of theories. Right, so that's what makes um, a discipline into science. Now, to your second question, initially I, I also worried about, but note, Dan, for example, is a historian. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, uh, in fact, the response by historians has exceeded my wildest expectations. Yes, maybe uh, uh, five percent of the time when we approach a historian, they say, "No, we don't believe in the project, and we are not going to help you to do such an evil thing." Right, that, that's very rare then maybe 20 or 30 percent just never respond but the majority more than half of the people we approach to help us to check data they actually respond and do some of them do some of them do enormous amount of work it's really gratifying mm -hmm. all right super and add to that as well so in my experience reaching out to colleagues and fellow historians um often it's been a lot of skepticism right away and they say well i you know i'm uncomfortable with the idea that sort of these rich historical narratives will be turned into data points. And that seems very limiting and they don't like it. And I say, okay, well, you know, let me, let me come and talk to you. Let me actually show you what we're doing. And almost all of the time, once you sort of sit down with them for 10 minutes and explain exactly what we're doing, that we're not losing any of the rich uh, descriptive information, we're just adding to it this sort of theoretic approach kind of on top of it, then the response has been amazing. And a lot of people have said to me, oh, you know, I thought you guys were total crackpots, but actually, yeah, this seems pretty legitimate. And I think that's really the, the majority historian response that we've been getting. Well, let me um, uh, first uh, tell our audience now that we're open for questions. So please ask questions either by uh, in your chat using the question function or uh, by raising your hand, in which case you can speak directly to us. And uh, so, uh, Dan, did you have another, uh, uh, were you about to make some other point? Well, the, uh, the other sort of question that maybe we'll, we'll open it up for a broader uh, dialogue is, Peter, the, one of the last slides you mentioned that um, obviously sort of competition and warfare and these sort of bad negative things are driving a lot of the uh, benefits that you get within societies and the um, creation of this pro-social traits and uh, cohesion internally with this sort of external group competition. And you mentioned in one of your later slides that recently some gentler forms of societal selection 
uh, have been uh, taking precedence. You mentioned some sort of economic competition. Um, the Arab Spring, which you could maybe argue isn't quite so gentle, uh, maybe compared to war, but it's still not an ideal way to, to drive these things. And one of the, one of the benefits, I think, of, of the approach and of the Seshat project is that, you know, we're delving into the deep past, but it has a lot of relevance for today and for the, the future of our collective species. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you think that sort of your understanding of how internal cooperation, how these good benefits to societies can be scaled up as we go along. Can we get some of these benefits without the harsh realities of warfare, of intense competition that kills people? Can we scale this up into sort of the next level of billions of people cooperating many different states together, um, sort of international scale competition? How would that work evolutionarily? How would it evolve? You can talk about that a bit. Right. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dan, for this question. So, uh, first of all, about gentle reforms, um, c competition between societies is still a destructive creation. So, um, think about the comp competition of firms in the marketplace. Uh, it happens non-violently, but people, uh, but firms go belly up. People lose jobs. They have to be retrained and things like that. So, some uh, such unpleasantness is uh, is inevitable. Um, but um, my goal in life is actually to get us humanity. I, I'm sure I do not accomplish it, but uh, one can work towards it so that all competition doesn't end up killing people, right? Okay, losing jobs and having uh, maybe uh, that's, uh, that's uh, inevitable, but let's avoid killing people. After all, in normal countries, um, CEOs don't order assassination of other CEOs. So let's get to that point. So um, I grew up in the Soviet Union. And so uh, the Soviet Union was a command-based uh, um, economy, and now it's a mixed-based economy, just like the United States. Mm -hmm. And the transition happened because the command-style economy was not working. I mean, it's a more complex story, obviously, but this was one of the big things. And so the success of capitalist, so-called capitalist societies, was an important factor in uh, Russians changing the certain cultural norms. Now, uh, we have in the Evolution Institute, we have a Norway project because there are some societies, Nordic societies in particular, and David is very much involved in it, uh, uh, together with Jerry uh, Lieberman, another member of the Evolution Institute. So uh, these Nordic societies tend to be ranked uh, at the very top of uh, personal happiness, and basically they have very uh, pro-social pro and effective governments and things like that. And so what we hope to accomplish is to use the process of imitation, all right, uh, by imitating successful societies. It is a cultural multi-level selection. Mm -hmm. And to, so that we can actually do things like that in the United States, uh, for example. So, and the final thing is that how do we actually uh, uh, gain cooperation at the level of society, of, of whole humanity? That's very difficult. United Nations is our best um, engine for that, but it's very ineffective. It has not been able to stop wars. So we have a lot uh, to learn, but I think that it's possible to do because humans have been, uh, over the last 10,000 years, um, expanding the scale of cooperation from villages to uh, a large, to a regional, groups to states and now you have uh, such uh, things as the European Union which is not uh, particularly functional at the point but it shows that it's possible for interstate cooperation and then and ISS International Space Station so we are actually capable of cooperating in very large groups and so we just, just need to make one final step to get it done at the humanity so we can stop the wars and solve global pro problems by global change well, let me, uh, I have so many questions to ask, but um, one, I want to push back a little bit, at least uh, uh, theoretically, on the idea that, uh, that um, it's the equitable societies that work best as societies. And that does seem to be the case empirically, as you know, from um, uh, other books, such as Why Nations Fail and the Spirit Level and so on, in addition to your own. Nevertheless, we have such things as slaveholding societies that were very successful as societies. So in principle, it seems to me that uh, it's not, enough, it's not invariably the case that the, the society that works best in between group competition is equitable. Uh, there, there, there appear to be exceptions to that rule. I just wonder if you could 
kind of maybe uh, fill in that that uh, that area. The, the story yes, but um, I would say empirically, um, uh, nickel societies like slave slaveholding societies, they're more fragile. So, for example, in the war between the states, uh, American Civil War, yep. the slaveholding society lost, and they partly lost because uh, a large proportion of their population who were slaves. They were afraid to give them uh, rifles uh, and arm them to fight on their side. In fact, slaves would escape from the south and join northern army. So, uh, so uh, I think that it, it, evolution, as you know, as you perfectly well know, is a very uh, chaotic uh, and long-term uh, thing. And so, for a while, slave societies could actually do better. All right, but um, eventually they lose in competition uh, to. Uh, other societies to other to more equitable societies yeah and so another question i have has to do with the uh, origin of variation because in in simple models then the larger a unit is then the less variation there is just because of sampling error and mixing and things like that but that appears not to be the case uh, something about social dynamics uh enables lots of variation to take place it would seem at all scales so uh how, what do you think about the variation part of the uh, variation and selection process? Why is it that new forms uh, arise? And is that stochastic? I mean, it seems to me that there'd be something inherently unpredictable about when and where uh, a new uh, social form will arise. Well, yes, there is a lot of stochasticity, obviously. Humans are not as smart as we think uh, we are. It's very difficult for humans to see the consequences of a new institution that you propose. But, uh, lar but larger, uh, larger, larger societies actually are pretty good engines of, um, of, um, of generating new variation. So think about larger societies have large cities, and there is a lot of empirical research showing that large cities, as cities uh, increase in size, they become more important as engines of innovation, both uh, technical but also social technologies uh, get generated. So it's a very interesting, it's very different from uh, genetic uh, selection. And th which is why, by the way, cultural multi-level selection works, whereas genetic multi-level selection uh, works very rarely. Well, that's a separate conversation. But, uh... yeah, it's a separate conversation. But cultural multi-level selection, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, I have a whole lecture I teach in my class explaining why humans have been pre-adapted pre for cultural multi-level uh, uh, selection. And so this uh, generation of uh, variants uh, is actually one of those uh, pre-adaptations. And how about the role of intentional change? So are people like consciously inventing these things uh, uh, and uh, or is it more sort of serendipitous? Uh, probably yeah. the answer is both, but, but uh, what is the role of, of uh, just basically intentionally evolving the future of one's culture? That's an empirical question, and I hope that if somebody gives us um, a few hundred thousand dollars, you'll be please, able to <laughs> you'll, you'll be able to tell uh, to tell. But but, but uh, my answer uh, now is that I, in a now model, which presupposes that humans are not particularly intentional, may explain an awful lot of uh, variability in uh, even technological progress, because much of the te technical progress is done by small steps of trial and error, which is <clears throat> often blind to the consequences, and then you 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 see the consequences, and you be, uh, you do the process of selection and select the way uh, things that you introduced that have bad consequences. So I think a very simple-minded model of of this could do a long way to explaining the technological progress over the last ten thousand years. Right, right. Dan, you have some more to say. Um, hi, well, everybody. I was going to cut in. We have quite a few questions um, oh, that have been submitted. Yep, yeah, we do. So, um, Michelle would actually like to ask Peter a question directly. So, I'm going to unmute Michelle now. Okay, hi, Michelle. Peter. Hi, hi Michelle. Uh, really excellent talk. Uh, my question has to do with um, the sort of increasing complexity of the world and how you see uh, the, the research that you're doing playing into not just increased, you know, the kind of threat of warfare, which is still present on the planet, but also the more technological innovations that are happening all over the place, the sort of increasing rate of change on technology and robotics on uh, what are the, how do these all interact, these kinds of societal forces that were not present, you know, in the CSAT database, CSAT database uh, to uh, predict 
ultra sociality now. Uh, it seems to me that we're undergoing this rapid, you know, really huge uh, exponential amount of change on the planet. That how do you uh, sort of see the study of cultural evolution helping to understand that, uh, especially technological change? Right. Well, first of all, cultural evolution, because cultural culture is cumulative, I think it's a great theory to understand uh, this, the rate of technological progress. And as I mentioned, we actually submitted twice a grant proposal to try to test cultural evolutionary theories of, te of technological progress. So that's one thing. Now, as to the consequences of, of technical change for cooperation, it has both uh, positive and negative uh, aspects, as technologies uh, tend to do. So let me give you both examples. On the positive side of things, uh, the new way of connecting people and uh, monitoring governments. So uh, the internet basically allows us to, uh, to control our rulers much better. So uh, there is an initiative that actually is putting all the government's expenditures online. And that's very good because it will help us to knowledge. Uh, monitoring is the first step in, in imposing cooperation. Monitoring then followed by sanctioning. So if we see corrupt practices, then we have a possibility to sanction those politicians in a variety of ways. And that is a good prosocial thing. On the negative side, the robotics and automation is something that has to be managed very carefully. And we have been failing in that. It, uh, robotics and automation has been contributing. Uh, the robots have been replacing people. And our capitalist class has be used that to uh, depress essentially the salaries of workers. So the more robots we have, the more people are looking for work. So the, the demand, uh, the supply of labor increases and that drives the cost of labor down. So this is where we cannot allow simple uh, capitalism to manage this type of a thing. This, is, this has to be done at the society level or we will end up with a small group of uh, very wealthy individuals who will be protected by the robotic cops and uh, soldiers and the rest of the humanity. I don't know what, maybe uh, completely immiserated or even, you know, put into, uh, well, let's not uh, go into uh, too far in these negative scenarios. So technology uh, has uh, both uh, uh, positive uh, things. It enables us to cooperate better, but it also throws a very variety of challenges that we have to overcome. Yeah, just follow up question. I mean, what is the role then of uh, leaders in manufacturing external threats to help uh, increase cohesion? Yeah. Uh, among its populace. Um, because it seems to me that as that that's a that's a samba that might be occurring as technology is making people less cooperative or, or threatening inequality, that that gives leaders the chance to, uh, in a very savvy cultural evolution way, seek out conflict, uh, yeah. etc. So um, and that in itself has consequences for conflict, etc. So what what do you think? The world today clearly seems to be yeah. Well, these humans have evolved to cooperate within group in opposition to other groups. And so savvy leaders who are, many of them don't know cultural evolution, but they understand it, understand it at an intuitive level. And so it's very typical for a ruler to try to create a small victorious war to pull the population behind them. So this is where the, our, uh, we, it's the job of ours, us uh, non-rulers to, uh, to constrain our rulers not to do things like that. It's very difficult to do. But uh, the only way uh, we can do it is have organizations uh, that will constrain rulers uh, to behave in pro-social ways and not to do this type of a thing, uh, thing for example. And fortunately, we've been evolving such uh, institutions for the last couple of thousand years. So we just need to continue doing that. Uh, so we have seven more minutes, six more minutes. And Ashley, I'm not seeing the questions on my screen. So if you could moderate the questions, uh, uh, then uh, please do. Sure. So um, we have quite a bit of questions. I'm going to try to combine some of them. A few of the topics are similar. So Alan and Jack both were interested in, does the internet or social media have the potential to take us to a new level of ultra sociality? And if so, what are the barriers? Yes, I think um, there are uh, some good examples of cooperation, which has been enabled by internet. Think about Wikipedia, for example. 
So uh, internet, mostly, I think internet has a very positive way. First of all, it creates much, it, it's, uh, it opens our societies. And so uh, people like uh, WikiLeaks, uh, for example, I think they serve a positive function in exposing uh, bad rulers to, uh, to, uh, so that we know that, uh, uh, that they are being uh, bad, right? As I said, monitoring is a very important step in uh, ensuring cooperation. So, um, and also um, internet connects people. I can be, I can be uh, you know, here in the uh, stores Connecticut and I can collaborate with people in Europe and in Japan and so on and so forth. And so uh, uh, that, uh, that's also a good thing. Actually, I don't know bad things that uh, connectivity and information revolution has done for us. I think it's uh, pretty much analoid good, unlike automation. Oh, really, Peter? So, I mean, it seems to me that you actually gave good, good news and bad news in your previous answer. And I think there's many invasion of privacy, for example, would be one, uh, would be one. But uh, it seems to me that what the Internet does is it's just a, another medium for social interactions. And those social interactions are subject to multi-level selection just the way any other um, are. So we get such things as hate speech uh, uh, and, and, and all of that. I think the most interesting thing to say about that is that um, is that unless there's selection at the at the at the group level, you're not going to get things working well at a group level, mm. and that that applies to the internet in the same I way that it applies say. to anything else. I hear what you say, but I was looking at it from the point of view of enabling cooperation, and so yes, losing uh, privacy is uh, uh, you know a bad thing, obviously. Uh, but I was uh, thinking, uh, does uh, the uh, does the information revolution uh, aid cooperation at large scales or not? As to uh, the, um, uh, yes, we have things like fake news and things like that, but fake news, the nice thing about fake news, uh, the positive side of that, is that internet actually connects you to a very a great variety of uh, sources. So it's really our job to, to, to hear different sides of the question so we can decide which is fake news and which is not. So, yes, it's not, okay, it's not all sweetness and light, but, uh, but I think that overall the balance is positive. That's my theory. Okay. Um, next question is, um, Ben is interested in the role of human psychology in your model, for example, the irrational king that decides to take on, take his nation to war. So could you elaborate a little bit more about that? So, um, yes, I have not talked much about our evolved psychologists. And of course, the uh, cultural evolution uh, works together with genetic evolution. It's known as gene culture co-evolution. And that's really uh, how um, we actually changed from ape-like ancestors five million years ago to what we are now. And as a result of that, we have a lot of uh, that evolved psychology layered uh, in various layers. So we have an ape uh, layer, we have a, a small scale uh, forager layer, People, that's our equity, uh, inequity aversion norms. And we also have complex society layers. We are actually capable of following orders and uh, functioning in uh, in um, hierarchies. So uh, this, is a, this is a huge uh, topic. I tend to work more on the macro social scale, looking at what happens to whole populations rather than talking about individuals. But of course, all those uh, macro social forces that are filtered through individuals, individual actions. So hopefully I understood your question and addressed it. Uh, if not, please. And by the way, let me make a, um, a note that um, I will ask Ashley for your questions at the end, and I will put, uh, I will um, I try to answer them. Uh, well, as I don't know how many there are, but I'll try to answer as many as I can. And I'll uh, post it on my blog, petertorchard.com. So that way your questions will not be wasted. Thank you very much for asking them. Maybe we have time for one more quick one. Do we, Ashwin? Um, well, this will end in about one minute. Um, so I think that so that Peter can answer to the fullest that he can. Um, Peter, I think that's a fantastic idea. I'll send you these. There's not too many. Um, so this way you can um, be able to give them the time that they need. Right. Okay. Well, then we're going to end promptly on the hour. This will be available for posterity. And uh, we're going to have at least one of these uh, every month. I think it's one of the services that we provide to the T-Ball 1000 and other uh, EI 
uh, donors, and I think that uh, we have an amazing community of people here who are who are seeing the world through this evolutionary lens, and uh, and uh, this is just one example of the uh, of what can uh, what can come of it. So uh, thanks to both of you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time and interacting in between times. Uh, thanks to the magic of that internet that you were talking about. And I want to say thank you to David and Dan um, for moderating this discussion, and thank you to all the listeners, and thank you to all the uh, sponsors who have contributed to help the Evolution Institute and SESHAT, because without uh, such resources, we would not be able to collect all those wonderful data. Exactly. All right. That's very much. Thank you. Thanks to Ashley also, uh, the uh, maestro behind, behind the screens. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen.